I'm a big fan of Piaget because Piaget says we learn by doing and teaching is very much all about learning by doing. So bear with me as I experiment on you and with you. Thank you. Yes, sorry, you need to begin again. Okay, so meanwhile, we can look at what's on the thing. On the, you can read that, right? Let me actually just, uh, yeah, perfect. So it prepares us for potential situations that we can face in real life. How does acting out like your teacher prepare you for a real life situation? Think about that. I asked you guys for an articulated response, not these one-off one-liners. What? I'm sorry? I didn't understand what the question was. The question was that when you play and engage in the game, do you have your mind and mind from it? That's the question. According to Vygotsky. But all Vygotsky. They take the role of the person and think cognitively the act they play they put themselves in that position and act accordingly. Does anybody want to comment? Feel free to. Um, it involves using creativity and taking on roles children observe, showing that they can configure what roles around them. People play in, why am I reading these? You can read them. Sorry, force of habit. Um, no. Okay. Okay, so uh, children and whenever uh, children play, do adopt to people who inspire them and who influences them or whoever they like or something which is different. And when they, uh, they pretend to be uh, like someone else, and the consequences, the after effects from people around them help them understand what is a socially normal way to behave and socially different way to behave. Because the times people are uh, children, especially they are inspired by some negative roles in a movie or some cartoon. And when they mimic it, they get negative consequences. So they learn that, okay, this is not what I am supposed to do. So basically, this helps them to understand how they are supposed to behave in society, how they are supposed to care, how they are supposed to talk. And thus, it helps them to cause mental development. So they are learning something very important that you said, and I want you to focus, actually, the class to focus on that socially normal, socially deviant, which is very much defined by the cultural norms and values, right? Which is why this is called the socio-cultural approach. And you're absolutely right that when children are role-playing, they're reenacting those norms and values that they are observing and are learning through interaction. So that's correct, thank you. I would like you to now pass, can you grab the mic from her? And meanwhile, Naval, go ahead. Uh, so my point was basically, I think uh, through pretend play, we talked about egocentrism in our last class as well. So perhaps through pretend and role play, children can learn about different situations and different perspectives that are not just their own. And so as they grow older, they can come to understand the different ways in which different roles in society and those around them act. And if they were to take on such roles, they would know how to perform and they would know how to, as mentioned previously, perform in a society, socially acceptable way or conform to the norm, if that is what was around them or if that was the way they pretend did in, in their childhood. Okay, so you're talking about theory of mind development essentially, right? That's excellent and that's absolutely correct. That is a uh, super important cognitive developmental milestone that role play, according to both theorists, helps achieve um, the ability for perspective taking. Because as you said, I, I actually you said everything so well, I'm not going to reiterate it. Good job. Um, so you can go and then Josefa. Yeah, so that's exactly what I wanted to touch on. And like the theory of mind, because that's going to help their cognitive uh, process and actually allow them 
Yeah, that, that's good. One more thing, because you guys have mentioned egocentrism, according to Vygotsky, um, this is a very important concept. He says that children have private speech. Okay, So private speech uh, is a similar concept to egocentrism, which Piaget came up with. Private speech, may, and this is why language is the building block for cognition, according to Vygotsky. In private speech, children are listening to whatever is being said to them. Remember, in whatever language, verbal, nonverbal, they are observing, they are thinking about it. But they are thinking about it in a sort of a dialogue with themselves. That's the process of internalizing information. As the child grows older through activities like role play and pretend play, that private speech shifts and that is then sees it, sorry, the private speech changes and becomes um, separated, sort of. So it's not like everything is no longer being interpreted just from an internalized perspective. But that happens as a child grows older. So that's his concept, and that's something you should know. Private speech, we so we, Piaget's egocentrism. Okay? Related, but different. Okay, Josefa. اچھا تو اب جیسے کہ استاد اور شاگرد ہے تو مطلب جب بچے پہلی دفعہ کھیلیں گے تو یقیناً ان کے اندر مطلب انہوں نے وہ صرف دوسروں کو دیکھ کر کر رہے ہوں گے یہ کام ٹھیک ہے دوسروں کی نقل اتار رہے ہوں گے لیکن ساتھ ساتھ اسی جو ان کا انٹریکشن ہوگا جو آپس میں ان کا تعلق ہوگا اس کے ذریعے سے وہ اپنی لینگویج کو بھی اچھا کر رہے ہوں گے مضبوط کر رہے ہوں گے چاہے وہ وربل ہو یا نان وربل ہو تو اس طرح سے ان کی جو ایبلٹیز ہیں کوگنیٹو ایبلٹیز وہ ڈیولپ ہوں گی خود بخود Yeah, absolutely. That's very important. Okay. The cognitive abilities for language, for speech itself also continue to improve just as they work, pretend play may engage. That's a very good point. And I think that's something that a lot of people have said on this chat as well. Empathy, absolutely. Um, problem solving, yes. Children tend to simulate the problems that they've seen around them in their role play or in their pretend play. I mean, if you've ever seen a child playing, uh, you know, if they're the nurse, they'll be like, oh, you have a fever, let me take your temperature. Um, and uh, if you see a child playing tea party or something like that, it will be like, oh, your teacup is empty, let me refill it. These are like basic rules, manners, norms, values, so on and so forth. And, um, Play is so important to the development of cognition that there are entire research studies that are spread over years examining the relevance of play to, let's call it, holistic and positive development. Um, that's something, if any of you are interested, you should read about it. Finland is doing some fabulous work um, on that. Uh, empathy, yes, communication, yes, communicate in the context of their role, yes, absolutely, like was mentioned, social and cultural norms allows them to identify role models, not exactly, actually. Um, they start thinking from other points of view, imagining different uh, problem solving, communication makes sense, empathy, communication, problem solving, problem solving, language, example, problem solving, role playing, learning by doing. Uh, learn to avoid norms, values, imitation, models, pretend play, pretend play, comfort with situations they have not faced before. Interestingly, children cannot simulate a situation that they haven't already seen when they are young. So they have to know what something is before they can pretend play it. So please remember that. Um, development, imagination, creativity, remember the role they are playing, confidence. Yes, you're all right. You all said the exact same 
really correct things. Now, if you have something that absolutely can't wait, I'll hear it. Otherwise, I do have more stuff to teach you. So I'm going to. I'm going to be a dictator now. OK, awesome. Who is that? Was it on the thing? Was it someone there? Who? That was a bit scary. Are you okay, student? Student with the noise, are, are you all right? I hope you are. Okay, sorry, you have a question. What's your name? Okay, what's your question? Yes, he says we have those abilities innately, but they develop through social interaction and Social interaction helps us learn not only academic and problem solving concepts, but also helps us learn the norms and the values, the rights and the wrongs of the society and culture we occupy. Um, and we learn this through our peers, our same age group, uh, who are more knowledgeable than us, as well as the adults in our life. Piaget doesn't reject it, he simply doesn't account for it because he doesn't account for differences in society and culture. So it's good theory the missing element. Okay, another question. Uh, does, does language also help us uh, build or develop our memory? What do you think? I think so. When you think about what happened on uh, Monday in class, what are you using to remember? You're using words to reconstruct that memory, right? Yeah. Images and words, right? So absolutely, yes. Okay, I'm not listening, now moving on. Sorry, not listening, not even looking. Um, next, very important theory, stage-based also, moral development. Now, this is a pretty tricky area. It's a gray area um, in the sense that morality is a gray area, right? What is good in one culture may not be considered good in a different culture. Uh, good itself, you know, the word is a loaded word. It's a value judgment. Uh, it's very subjective, right? So um, somebody may think that it is good in some cultures. For example, I actually forget about somebody. Think. For example, in some cultures, it is good to wear black to a funeral. In other cultures, it is good to wear white to a funeral. And in yet other cultures, it is good to wear colored clothes to a, to a funeral, right? Really small examples simply to demonstrate how subjective good and bad are. And the reason I'm talking about good and bad, you can even think that way about true and false. These are binaries, but they are not absolute binaries. And the minute you start thinking about good and bad or true and false as absolute binary concepts completely polarizing and fixed that is where you lose your own subjectivity that is the point at which you lose your capacity to reflect um hmm, okay sorry um so I want to I want to just remind me in class people and also online people I read you can remind me yourself I want to come back to this uh, this question that you've asked but right now let's talk about morality so when you're talking about moral development what are you talking about if good and bad is so subjective if truth and falsehood is so subjective or rather not shallow not subjective but like relative right then how are we supposed to have a conversation about the development of morality when we can't even define what morality is, All right? So let's assume for our purposes that morality in our discussion refers to generally broader ethics, a sense of justice, a sense of fairness, a sense of equitable society, sense of equality in a society, right? Um, 
all human beings are human beings and deserve to be treated equally regardless of gender, race, creed, caste, whatever. Right? Let's, let's assume that that is what morality means here for our purposes. We're not a philosophy class. So we're not going to get into that. But when we talk about uh, moral development, you will always encounter the theory of moral development proposed by Lawrence Kohlberg. Now, Kohlberg did this really, really extensive study with young um, white males from when they were basically very young up until they were in their later stages of adulthood. If I'm not misremembering, he followed them from the age of about 10 or 11 till they were about 25, 26, or uh, maybe older actually, I, I'm forgetting to be honest, but I think it was a 17, 18 year long study or an 11 year long study, very extensive. Um, now his study, what he did was that he would pose this dilemma and he would ask his interview respondents to to tell him what they thought and to explain why they thought what they thought. Okay? Now the dilemma is or was that he proposed. Uh, the dilemma was called the Heinz dilemma, like the ketchup or the mayonnaise. And he says that Heinz has um, Heinz is a man who lives in a small village and his wife is dying. Okay? And she can only be cured by one particular drug. That drug is available at the village pharmacy. But Heinz is a poor man and he can't afford the drug. So he goes to the pharmacy and he tells the pharmacist, give this to me, I'll pay you back in installments. The pharmacist says, no. Then Heinz says, okay, give this to me and I'll give you half the money now and I'll give you half the money later. The pharmacist says no. So Heinz in desperation breaks into the store, steals the drug, right? And obviously saves his life. Question is, is Heinz in the right or in the wrong? Should Heinz be punished? What do you think out of curiosity? Should Heinz be punished? Yes, no. How many for yes should Heinz be punished? One, two, three, three, four, five, six. I'm only counting the yeses. So if you say no, it's okay. Just don't, yeah. Six people. Okay. Um, so here's the thing. Kohlberg would explain or would ask you to explain why you say yes. I'm not going to do that because we don't have a lot of time. But he would then use your explanation to figure out which of his stages of moral reasoning you would fit into. So that's what he did. He interviewed these young men and he saw what their justification was, that G. Heinz should be punished or no Heinz shouldn't be punished. And using the justifications he gave, they gave him, depending on their ages, um, he managed to come up with these stages of moral development, moral reasoning. Focus on the word reasoning, because the theory of moral development, as per Kohlberg, is also a cognitive development theory, because it is not about this gray and, you know, what's it called, this gray subjective area. Heinz's theory is very much about cognition, about moral reasoning, right? How do you solve problems of morality, basically? So um, he comes up with these stages, and now I'm going to have to refer to this because unlike Piaget, I always forget his. But in a nutshell, there are three key stages, and they are pre-conventional morality, conventional morality and post-conventional morality. Do you know what a convention is? 
apart from the social event that we call convention, there's another meaning of the word convention. Hmm? Tradition. Tradition, absolutely. Um, which we would understand in this context to be more like people who are unconventional are called unconventional because they they don't act according to norms, they ignore norms, they ignore tradition, right? So, sorry? I don't necessarily agree, but the pro, so define convention as adherence to norms and values, right? So pre-conventional is before you've even understood what the norms and values of morality are in your, in your um, culture, in your context. Conventional is when all of your moral reasoning is driven by those norms, by those values. Post-conventional is when you have now stopped thinking about society says it's right, so it must be right. And you are now thinking in terms of your own thoughts about what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong. Okay? So very simple. And again, I'll remind you, he was inspired by Piaget. Um, he was a student of Piaget's. He admired Piaget's approach, the stage-based approach. And so he came up with these three key stages. Okay? Now within his three key stages, there are these sub-stages. And I'm not going to teach you all of them, but um, I'm going to teach you some of them so that you kind of understand this approach. So the first one, which was pre-conventional morality, according to Kohlberg, at this point, remember, pre-convention, right? It's before exposure and understanding of norms or values. So you're quite young at this age. You're a child. When you're a child, Kohlberg says that you are looking at an external authority figure to tell you what is right and what is wrong. Okay, you're not looking at the world and thinking about the bigger questions. You're just like, you know, my mother said this is bad, so this is bad, right? My teacher said this is good, this is good. That's the first thing. So you are not really using your own capacity. Um, and this is called uh, obedience and punishment in its most basic form when you're at your youngest, where you just do the right thing because you want to not get punished. And you, do, you also, by the way, part and parcel, you think that it's okay for your authority figure to punish you, which is good in some ways, but can also be problematic when you think about a lot of little children who get smacked around and think it's okay, it's normal to get smacked smacked around and don't do anything about it. Um, so yeah, remember that. Uh, sorry, I lost my thought. Um, and then you have, oh, right. Um, this is cute when children do this. Uh, individualism and exchange, it's very sweet. Have you, if you have a little uh, brother or sister or cousin, have you ever tried to bribe them to do a good thing? where you're like, if you just stay quiet for literally five minutes and don't ask me another question, just for five minutes, I will give you something you really want. I have done this shamelessly with my friends' children. Um, individualism and exchange, what is in it for me? What are you gonna give me if I behave the way you are saying I should, right? So you're moving now, you're moving a little bit from obedience to that authority, blind obedience, motivated by avoidance of punishment to what's in it for me, what will I get out of being good, right? Pre-conventional. When you move to the conventional state, at that point, there is still authority, which is external, but it's more dispersed. So your friends are your moral authority. Society is your moral authority. When you're maybe six or seven years old and your best friend in school cheats off your exam, you don't even know what cheating is. Okay. Um, and this is your friend, but like your teacher said that this is a bad thing to do. And so you go to your teacher after class and you say, miss, he copied from my notebook. Okay. Um, when you're a little older, let's say 11, 12, 13 years old, your friend cheated on you, uh, cheated off you on a math test. 
you do nothing about it. In fact, you think you've done a great thing for your friend. How many people have done this? Right? You think you are the best friend in the whole world. Because your definition of right, wrong, your moral reasoning is now starting to come from your peer groups. Right? And while you've helped your friend, if you get caught by your teachers or your parents, then you're going to feel very bad. Yes? And then you're not going to do it again. Why? Because you want to be seen as good. The reason you didn't report your friend is because you want to be seen as good. The reason you feel bad when you finally get caught is because you want to be seen as good. Good according to who? Good according to the society's norms and cultures of what good behavior is. So this is very conveniently called the good boy, good girl orientation, um, which is part of the conventional stage. And then you move on to this. Uh, this happens like maybe around 24, 25, I don't know, maybe earlier as well, 18, 19. It's uh, called the social order orientation. You do the right thing, and this lasts for many years, by the way. You do the right thing, all your moral reasoning is motivated by your understanding and your desire to keep society free of chaos. Okay, you're like, I'm not gonna, for example, uh, I'm not going to come late to class like ever because I don't want that the 20 people who did show up one time should have their learning disrupted by the 15 of us who showed up 15 minutes late. You all know who you are. I judged you today, being honest. But anyway, moving on. You will try to be on time because you want to preserve the greater good. That's your conventional moral reasoning still. Still conventional. Why? Because it's still the authority for your morality is still dispersed in wider society. But then, not everybody gets here. But there is hope. At some point, you reach this stage of post-conventional morality where you're like, I finally understand that just because I don't like someone doesn't mean that they should get a bad deal in life. You finally understand that, okay, even if I'm Pakistani, that doesn't matter that I, I mean, that, that shouldn't stop me from caring about what is happening to people across the other side of the world, right? And you actually mean it. You're not doing it because you want to be part of like a hashtag. You're doing it because you give a, you, you care, right? So it's, it's like um, a broader sense of social justice, a broader sense of fairness, of equality, the ability to look at the Heinz dilemma and say that, no, actually, it's not Heinz who should be punished, it's the pharmacist who should be punished. And then move on from that and be like, but the law needs to change, right? And then be like, but this is not about one person, it's about a systemic issue. So for example, America's race problem is not about Donald Trump, it's about history and systemic racism, right? So you move beyond that lens of blaming and you start thinking about accountability and right and wrong, you start thinking about institutions and systems and broader principles, and you step completely into the gray. Now, this is a wonderful, transcendent, beautiful, aspirational stage, and this is the problem with Goldberg's theory. There is no evidence to show that this is how our moral reasoning develops. None. Apart from his interviews of these white, upper middle class boys who became men. Right? 
apart from, and by the way, Heinz was not the only dilemma he posed. I don't know, I should clarify, there are a bunch of other ones, but this is the one that is the most famous one, so I just taught you this one. Um, and the, sorry, not the, uh, what's his name? Goldberg later on also came up with a fourth stage of some kind, uh, which I haven't, to be honest, bothered reading about. But um, how can you define moral reasoning in this way, or the development of moral reasoning in this way, as Goldberg has done? I gave you examples of how you see this around you in children, right? Um, how we've all done it also. But can you actually look at the development of moral reasoning in this really neat, clean cut, stage based way? Did you always obey your parents when you were little because you just didn't want to be punished? Did you, I don't know, um, has there ever been a time where you did the right thing, even though you didn't want to do the right thing, but you did the right thing not because of somebody else, but you did it for yourself, because you knew that you would feel bad for yourself later on, and you think that you're better than this, and you want to be a bigger person, you want to take the high road. And it's not motivated by some sense of, you know, I want a great afterlife for myself. It's literally like I just want to be better as a human. And if that's ever happened to you, then clearly there are massive problems with Goldberg's theory. Right? Because inherently, for a lot of us, there is already a sense of wanting to be good as defined by you. And absolutely, when you are a child, everything you receive is given to you by external authorities, right? So you are naturally going to think that the adults in your life know best what is right and what is wrong. You don't know better. Your capacity to think has not become as complex, right? Think about Piaget, think about Vygotsky. They're all talking about the fact that you have this basic ability, but only as you age and grow older, depending on what kind of environment you're in, are you going to develop the capacity for complex reasoning, to understand catch-22 situations, dilemmas, so on and so forth, right? So think about that, hold that in your mind. This is a big problem with Colbert's theory. Um, sorry, I need to now just see. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, there's a big, there's another big problem with Goldberg's theory. Anybody want to tell me what it is? Yes. We did a okay. reasoning doesn't predict behavior. That's an that's a really great point. Um, thank you. Uh, so somebody in your class has made this brilliant point that reasoning doesn't determine your behavior or is not an accurate predictor of how you will actually act on that reasoning or not act on that reasoning, which is really great. Now I want you to think of a research study, very famous, so popular that I'm not going to bother to give you a summary of it. But we did cover it very briefly when we were talking about research ethics. Think about that study. Think about people who commit war crimes but are otherwise upstanding citizens. How are you going to explain their moral reasoning? And are they, or tell me what that study is, anybody? I didn't tell you, tell me who that study is. I said, tell me what that study is. I want somebody online to answer. Zephyr? 
वो ये वाला है ना जो जिसमें ये प्रेजेंट वाली स्टडी या दूसरी स्टडी है जिसमें आपको आप बताओ सवाल आपसे है मेरे से नहीं तो इस इस तरह की दो दो स्टडीज है एक वो प्रेजेंट वाली थी ठीक है और एक जिसमें आपको इलेक्ट्रिक्यूट करना होता है जिसमें आपको बिजली का झटका लगाना होता है और दोनों में आप जो है ना जो आपको रोल्स दिए जाते हैं उसके उसके आप कन्फॉर्मिटी कर रहे होते हैं उनसे प्रेजेंट वाली स्टडी में क्या हुआ था आपको याद है मैं स्टूडेंट्स को प्रेजेंट गार्ड बना दिया था और कुछ स्टूडेंट्स को प्रिजनर्स बना दिया था ठीक है तो प्रिजनर्स जो थे वो प्रिजनर की तरह एक्ट करना शुरू कर देते कि कैदी उनकी तरह जैसे उनकी मेंटेलिटी होती है और जो प्रिजन गार्ड थे उस तरह सख्त गिरी करना शुरू कर दी थी उन्होंने इस तरह उमूमन पाई जाती है और ये इस पॉइंट से क्यों रिलेटेड है कि योर मॉरल रीजनिंग डज नॉट प्रेडिक्ट योर मॉरल बिहेवियर क्योंकि जो प्रिजनर जो मतलब स्टूडेंट्स थे उनकी मतलब वो चाहते होंगे कि इस तरह ना हो मतलब जो उनका मॉरल रीजनिंग होगी वो मुख्तलिफ होगी लेकिन जब वो उस सिचुएशन में आए उस आ, रोल के अंदर आए तो वो उस तरह करना शुरू कर दिया उन्होंने तो ये बता रहा है कि आपकी मॉरल रीजनिंग जो है ये नहीं है कि आप उसी तरह एक्ट करेंगे एक्ट मुख्तलिफ हो सकती है ठीक है फिर If I'm not wrong, the study that he's talking about is actually Zimbardo's study, but the ground study was similar in the sense that um, the participants were asked to shock the the person in the chair uh, if they would, were given a wrong answer, and the researchers found that even though they didn't want to shock the person, they still did because they saw an authority figure there, and regardless of their uh, moral beliefs or whatever, they still shocked them. Why was Milgram study instituted? What was the inspiration? Why did he do it? Um, he was trying to find out um, the reason behind why so many people followed Hitler's order during World War II. Good girl. Trick question. Tha. Sahi jawab diya. Now leave your A-level studies behind. Um, now, Nawal, uh, quickly, let's go with you, and then I want to go to some people in the room. um so nothing much uh, so i have basically covered what i wanted to say but um also in during in the in milgram's results we saw uh, physical reactions of the participants who got to a stage that was very uh, i wouldn't say traumatic but it required them to administer high amount of shock, high voltage shocks to the um, pretend um, you know participant um and so we saw through that how their moral reasoning was also triggering sort of a physiological uh, effect where they didn't really want to um administer the shock because they knew the consequences but because of the obedience and because of the authority figure there and their compulsion to obey they uh, administered it anyways yes absolutely that's what happened um so all goes to show this fabulous point that you what your name that mariam rehan made about reasoning is not how do you say a guarantee of behavior right uh it's like some of you may be like i love animals and animals should be protected but you see a stray dog you kick it and you walk on people do it and they sleep at night i don't know how but they do Now, moving forward, I'm not. I'm not going to advocate for animals today. So sorry to disappoint. And that's tomorrow. No, I'm just kidding. Next class, Monday. Um, we'll do five minutes on how to protect animals. But oh God, <laughs> uh, I'm not done talking about animals. Next up, we're talking about attachment theory. But no, we're not. There is one other problem with Kohlberg. Big problem. Huge. Huge. Say more. Gender bias. All of his participants were male and white. and from a certain class so 
problems with the sample. The sample size is actually pretty large um, for such an extensive, long study. It was a big sample, so that's not a, actually it wasn't so big. I guess the sample is also problematic, but um, his theory falls short of generalizability. Do you remember when we talked about how to think critically about a theory? We talked about, you know, a theory should be generalizable and falsifiable. So doesn't his theory meet those two? When you think about those two criteria, his theory falls apart a little bit, right? There's no actual empirical evidence that this is what happens to everybody, regardless of gender, regardless of society, race, whatever. Yes, you have something? That's absolutely, that's always going to be a problem with qualitative research because what he did was that he looked at these answers and then he came up with these assumptions based on the themes that were appearing in those answers. But as somebody very rightly pointed out, there is always going to be a problem with this sort of an interview setting with me structured OCM because sometimes people will simply tell you what they want you to hear. Secondly, sometimes people will not actually tell you the full extent of how they're thinking because there isn't enough rapport with your interviewer and so on and so forth. So those issues also absolutely problematic. Um, but those will be problematic in any theory. It's just that his sample is the bigger problem here, right? So that's also something to uh, remember. Now, So he observed these boys as they aged. So that's how he came up with this. But then the last part of it is um, making assumptions, right? Because he didn't know if they would actually become like this, um, uh, what's it called? Post-conventional morality stage, if they would actually reach that, right? It's just kind of like the logical order that he, felt, that he went into. Um, the last stage I remember now, sorry, I know I told you I didn't remember it, I didn't read it, I did read it, is basically about transcending right and wrong. So becoming like, if you know who the Dalai Lama is, becoming transcendental like Buddha. Um, I would love to say that we are all going to get there, but let's be fair. We are damaged by technology and probably won't make it. So now moving forward, last thing I want to talk about, last few minutes, and we're going to do this in detail on Monday. But this is something I want to also give you a heads up on. Uh, might bring up, might definitely actually will bring up some stuff from for you from your childhood. Um, and so, you know, if that happens, you can, you can, um, you can let your TNO, you can skip the class, read the book, it's fine. Um, I mean, I'll come to the question, thanks. Uh, so what we are going to be talking about on Monday is attachment theory. Okay. So cognitive development, moral development, we're done. Uh, Within moral development, however, Piaget, remember I told you Kohlberg was inspired by Piaget? So in a nutshell, Piaget did not come up with a stage-based theory of morality, but he said, well, I suppose it is stage-based. He said there are two stages, it's stage-based, uh, of moral development. You go from a heteronymous morality to autonomous morality. So when you're little, and this is, you can see now where Goldberg was inspired. So when you're little, you do what the right thing is um, because everybody's doing the right thing. Heteronic authority and then later by a sort of collective group that you belong to. And eventually he says that the goal should be moral autonomy whereby you are able to use your own capacity for logical reasoning and abstract thought to come to what you think is morally right and wrong. Okay. So that's what he said very broadly. See, 
and i just want to also clarify that his ideas were used more so um by us as educators to figure out intellectual autonomy as opposed to intellectual heteronomy basically having students who think about everything in exactly the same way say the same things and so on and so forth and how to sort of facilitate those students to become more independent and think out of the box and actually think for themselves monday however now coming back to monday we're talking about attachment theory which is why i said it might bring stuff up for some of you probably will bring up some things for every usually does attachment theory is about how you have been parented how you see the world today and quite literally have shaped the way that you can today relate to people the way that you sort of approach the entire world what is your mental model the world is a good place i can trust the world or the world is an awful place um so yes attachment styles are part of it but there's a little more um because attachment styles um and i also apologize i know this is not uh, i know you're dying to leave but i i did want to say i'm sorry because i realized i was talking to you about leon the uh the psychopath the 16 year old psychopath on monday and i uh, am potentially triggering and i'm sorry i forgot to do that um so next time i forget to do that uh let me know that i forgot to do that or or like just stop me i will not mind at all sometimes it's just hard to remember because i'm pressured to finish what i need to finish in class so call me out on this by all means all right thank you bye bye um and i'm sorry anish i will come back to your question i am sorry <laughs> uh but the point is yeah uh the more the exposure to media is the more the impact will be absolutely okay bye 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 online people